Jason, you were there, you were listening, you were experiencing it on the ground. Was there anything uh, that was said by Mayor Pete, which they refer to him as, that seemed to resonate, that seemed like it may have been uh, a step forward? You know, I, you know, in terms of how this audience was feeling, I, I'm not sure that they heard something that felt like a step forward. I think many of them, Anna, felt like what they heard was a step back to what they heard years ago, back in 2016, when many of them were asking the same questions about this police department, asking the same questions about officials who had promised that things would change, and yet here we are. I think that is why you're hearing so much frustration from so many members here in the community who came out and wanted to hear more about a couple of things. First of all, transparency when it comes to the department. Transparency in terms of when something goes awry in their eyes, what is being done to rectify that situation. And a lot of people out here, Anna, uh, are feeling that they're not hearing that right now. A couple of other things. When you talk about the department itself, the mayor himself admitted, look, he has not done enough, the city has not done enough to diversify the department. The, de the department is still overwhelmingly white, even just last week. Uh, you know, six new officers were sworn in. All of those six officers were white. Then when you look at what this, uh, members of this community have been uh, alleging all along, that you've got members of the department who are racially insensitive. You've got members of the department who they say uh, use excessive force. And so when you have a situation like what we just saw, where you have a man who was allegedly uh, trying to break into cars, allegedly pulls out a knife, he is shot, he is killed, all of that is happening on the backdrop of a community that years ago has asked for more help in terms of trying to build trust with the police department and promises were made. And what you hear is frustration over a number of people here in this community, Anna, who feel as though promises made promises not kept. Anna. Guys, let's listen again to some emotional moments from this town hall. So if I understood your question correctly, it's about a feature where when a gun is removed from its holster, that is then that automatically activates the body camera. Is that correct? No. I'm sorry, I can't hear Jordan. I cannot hear Jordan speak if you're shouting over him, please. When a shot is fired. When a shot, I don't know that has, so. Jo Jordan, good question. That, that technology exists, but it's not implemented. I, I asked... I had the same questions that you did, and I called the company myself, and I talked to them myself, and their best guess for the implement... implement let him talk. The, they Let don't even talk. have it testable yet. It will not be out rolled out until the spring of this coming spring is what the company told me. You can call and check and ask them with them. Same thing that I did. Call and ask them. Ron, race issues, as we know, and tensions have been front and center this week for the 2020 field. Yeah. Are voters paying attention to this? Well, certainly, first of all, at the local level, uh, I have been in cities uh, over the last couple of years from San Francisco and Milwaukee to Houston and Pittsburgh, and there is no issue in urban America that is more intractable and incendiary than the police use of force. I mean, it is, it is a central issue in cities everywhere, and in part because of one thing you saw today, which is that uh, African-American communities in particular feel that they are not being heard in their uh, unease and discontent about the way they are being policed, and, and that kind of sense of Jason was talking about that, you know, we've been trying to have this forum for years uh, and we never really got heard before. The other thing that's changed, I think, that has made these issues even more pointed is that cities are recovering. You know, cities were declining for when, when I was growing up in New York. It was the era of Ford to New York drop dead. It was kind of like a receding tide lowering all boats. Now you have the South Bend is, is an example of this, but certainly in other cities even more. Downtowns that are recovering, jobs that are coming in, incomes that are rising, and yet none of that seems seems to provide opportunities for kids in low income and minority neighborhoods where schools are still overwhelmingly segregated by income uh, and race. Uh, and so you see this kind of sense of isolation that, and, and exclusion uh, from a, uh, you know, a gleaming downtown, which I think South Bend, you know, to some extent uh, reflects as well, that, that, that exacerbates this, uh, this frustration. And I think all of these, these things coming together uh, are making these issues very, very pointed uh, in these cities at a 
time, Anna, as we've talked about, where cities have become the absolute geographic foundation of the Democratic coalition. Over half of Hillary Clinton's votes came from just the 100 largest counties in America. And I would submit to you, in virtually every one of those counties, uh, there are mayors and city councils that are dealing with precisely these issues. And in fact, Ellie Honig, who's here with me, I know you have investigated many a, a police shooting and dealt with some of the issues that we're seeing play out before us there in South Bend. Yeah, there's an incredible tension that comes into play here naturally. When you, and I've been to many, many meetings like the one we just saw. On the one hand, you have a community that feels this deeply. You could see, I think just now, viscerally, the hurt the pain that that community was feeling. And I think part of the problem that the mayor, Buttigieg, and the police chief had, and I think Professor Dyson was alluding to this, is you can't just go after the fact. You can't just go once this shooting has already happened and people are up in arms. You need to put in the time beforehand. And, and listening to the people talking today, there seemed to be a sense of, you're here now, but where were you before? On the other hand, you have the highest stakes kind of criminal investigation going on here. There is a police officer who is now being investigated for potential murder charges. Investigations need to be done secretly, to some extent, behind closed doors. And so there's a tension there between the need for transparency, mm -hmm. letting the community know what happened, but also doing the investigation properly and with all the safeguards that any person who's being investigated is owed. One of the big takeaways I have there, Dan, is the emotion in the room that we were seeing and feeling and hearing mm -hmm. from so many of the constituents who were there. And yet one of Buttigieg's assets on the campaign trail has been his very even temper, which we saw there, but that fell flat in this crowd. Yeah, I've covered Pete Buttigieg for the last few months pretty extensively, and that was actually more emotional than you see him on the campaign trail. Something that voters give him a lot of credit for is that he is even keeled, he gives answers that are lengthy and that are detailed, and he takes his time, and y you can almost see him thinking about things as he's answering. In that environment, yes, it, no it noticeably was different than the heat that was coming out of the audience. It, he wasn't giving that back, and he wasn't, he wasn't responding with such passion. But that really is who he is, and he was actually more emotional, I think, in this uh, venue than he is on the campaign trail. Uh, one thing that I did notice is at multiple times during the event, he faced up saying that, you know, I'm responsible. Mm. It is my fault. We have failed on these things. And we have a story out today that notes that in 2014, 10% of the uh, South Bend Police Department was African American. And today that number is 5%. Mm -hmm. That is clearly on the minds of people who are in that audience. And, and he faced up to that and said that that has been, that has been a failure. The way this resonates on the campaign trail, I think, remains to be seen. You know, there's obviously going to be a lot of coverage of this that's going to get out there. But I will tell you one thing that Buttigieg gets a lot of credit for on the campaign trail is facing up to things and being blunt about his failures or where he's working on things. Uh, that could, you know, the, the, the moments that he says, I made a mistake, I, I didn't handle this correctly, that I could see that playing well with uh, certain voters, but certainly this is going to... Uh, this is not what he wants going into a very critical week where he's going to be on the national stage standing next to Joe Biden at the debate in Miami. And it's a unique moment for him as well, because we have, for the last three months, seen a pretty unabated rise of Pete Buttigieg. And this has certainly been a very trying week, something he has acknowledged, and, and the political ramifications of it uh, could, could be significant.